Hi guys, I hope you had an amazing Christmas. And the amount of comments and support we've had from this channel has been absolutely incredible. So I picked out some questions and I'm going to try and answer them as well as I can. So the first question from Chris Manning, um, and he's asking why the players tap their fingers with their bridge hand um, when they're actually playing. Um, and is there a reason for it? There's actually not a reason for it. It's something that you just unconsciously start doing when you play play a lot of snooker. Um, Tony Mio back in the 80s was, was had it really pronounced that the middle finger would be would be like this almost. But it's nothing that helps um, with the player's game. It's just something that unconsciously over the years that it's a habit that they've got to do. A lot of players do it. In no way does it help you pop balls or play snooker any better. It's just something that, that, that you, you do unconsciously. Myself, I, I think, yeah, I've got a little tap a tiny tap with the middle finger, um, which is pretty much, the middle finger is pretty much the only one finger you could use. I mean, to, to move more than one would be pretty distracting, I think. So yeah, just a, a, a gentle sort of tremor with the middle fingers is, is the most common. Question from CW, um, who wants to know the correct sort of strength uh, that, that you grip on your cue. Um, what I always believe is when you're holding the cue, basically it should be just strong enough so it doesn't fall. So basically when you're, you're holding the cue, it's a, it's a pretty slack grip because when you're doing your waggles, as it were, you know, your fingers need to be able to sort of do what they want to do when you're going back and forward. So gripping too tight, as you can see, you can see my knuckles, it's quite restrictive. It's a very slack grip, but at the point of striking, you don't need to think about this because it happens automatically or it should do. You automatically will grip it tight when you strike the cue ball. But for the most, um, a very slack grip um, is what's needed. The reason, you know, pros miss shots under pressure or, or miss cue is generally gripping the, the, the cue too tight under pressure. And that's, you know, the wrong thing to do. So yeah, a slack grip is what you need. A question from Peter He, and it's regarding bridge length and, and cue length. Um, you know, I've heard that the 30.5 centimeters is, is like the, 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 the standard um, by which most players uh, go to. Um, I think it varies. You know, not everyone cues the same. Not everyone's the same height. You know, as, as regards to the, the, the optimum cue length, I mean, not everyone's the same height. So, everyone can't use a, the same sort of length of cue, as it were. So, I think a lot depends on the individual. Bridge length, I think, goes to if you want more power on a shot. I would say bring your bridge hand a little bit further away from the object ball, and if you don't want power maybe go a little bit closer in. But obviously you want to be a comfortable length, so whatever backswing that you have in your cue action, you need to leave the room to be able to do that. So I think having a, a sort of rigid length of bridge is, is wrong. I think you need to adapt to your style. So a question from Steve Coates, um, who's asking um, if the ghost ball method is better than finding the potting point. I think it's a preference. Um, I think the ghost ball me method, when you put a ball as if you're, you're setting up a straight plant, so you, you're hitting that ghost ball full in the face, obviously take it out of the way, and then that leaves you the potting point. So basically the both ways, to me, are doing virtually the same thing. I think the ghost ball method is a little bit longer way of going about it. At the end of the day, when you take the ghost ball away, you still got to look at that potting point. If the cue ball's here, and we want to cut the black into the middle pocket, what the ghost ball, you're basically putting the red in line with the black in the middle pocket. Now that's the same thing really as finding the potting point, but if you come around there, so if you're hitting that red full in the face, that's the potting point to put the black into the middle. So basically you get down, you take the red out of the way, and you should be able to find that potting point. But I think it's the same thing basically, it's coming around, having a good look, and then keeping your eyes on that potting point, keeping it on it until you actually get down to play the shot. Both work. I prefer just finding the potting point. A question from Jamal, who's having problems with her middle bag potting. Um, it's something that is, is a unique part of the game. There's some players on the tour that are quite weak into middle pockets and some that are very strong. James Watana, for instance, in the 80s and 90s from Thailand was tremendous in the middle pockets. It is different. There is a different um, potting point because you want to aim for, for favor the far jaw. But in terms of practice, uh, you've got two balls that are in the, the, the middle of the table. You could actually, put the blue up as well, but the blue's pretty simple because you're getting the whole pocket. So I would say practice browns into each middle and pinks into each middle. And you can start with straight pots, you can start with, ang get more, ang more angles. So yeah, I think 
you know, it's all about practice. Middle pockets can be tricky, especially when you're at a cute angle, but um, yeah, Jamal, practice blue, brown, and pink, and you'll soon be potting them all the time. A question from Jack on reading the table. Um, it's quite an important thing as a snooker player because when you're sat in your chair, people always ask me when you're sat in your chair, what you're thinking about? Um, because you've got to keep concentrating. So what, what I generally used to think about is if my opponent was at the table, when could he miss? When could he see a problem? And, and you've got to be ready when you come to the table. So say for, for instance, my opponent's missed. You can see the blue and say he's missed the blue. So he's put the blue and pink in a safe position. It's left me this red. So you've got to read the table. So you come to the table and obviously you don't want to spend too long, but you can see the blue and pink are together, the black's out of commission. So although I've got an easy starter, straight away I'm reading the table and thinking, okay, what red am I going to play for after the yellow or brown, whatever color I play after this red, to be able to bring the blue and pink and black into play. So it's, you know, my, my situation would be, you know, this is, this red, is a good one if I get the red in that corner and angle to maybe bring the blue and pink into play or if I get on one of these reds I could maybe cannon this red away from the black so you, you, you've got to try and read the situation when you come to the table it's it's very difficult obviously for a beginner to learn this because all the beginner you want to do is come to the table and pot the ball but as a pro you've got to see the situation and see how can I somehow win the frame at this visit uh, I'm sure a lot of you have been watching the pros take on the tough table challenge and that's uh, that's similar to this, we've got reds in each cushion and you've got to try and work out as a professional um, a way of trying to win the frame in one visit. It doesn't always work, but that's what reading the table is. Seeing where the colours are, see where the reds are. If I can get in a red in a certain way to bring a colour into play, that'll help my chances of winning the frame. A question from Alpha V um, regarding how, I think, well, how snooker differs from pool. Can you play each game the same way? Um, can you play snooker the same way you play pool? Um, I don't think you can. I think if you watch pool players play, the cue actions are different. I always tend to say that snooker's like chess and pool's like drafts. Because um, the, the tactics and, and the cue ball control in snooker is so much more difficult. It, it's amazing when you see snooker players trying to play pool, as I have in China. And it's very, very difficult. It's a different talent. It's a different um, technique. The, the way you clear the table, the patterns are completely different. A great example, Judd Trump played in the US Open a couple of years ago and the first proper player he played, he lost 9-0. So it just shows you snooker players can't just automatically go from snooker to pool. There's different ways of playing each game. I think cue ball control, I think, is probably um, the main difference. There's a lot more, I think, finesse and more accuracy in the cue ball control and snooker. Um, I'm sure all you pool players will be commenting and raging at that comment, but um, yeah, you, I, I don't think you can play both um, sports the same way. So I've had a few questions asking um, a question that's been, well, it's been asked for years and years now. What's more difficult, a 147, a nine dart finish, or a hole in one? Now there's not, not even an argument. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the 147 is far more difficult than any of those two. The dartboard is always the same, nothing changes. 147, the balls go in different places all the time, um, and you've got to, I know the black ball's on its spot, but apart from that, you don't know where the reds are gonna, gonna go. You've got to develop that cue ball, you've got to position. Nine darts, I mean, they basically know the number straight away, don't they? I mean, they know which ones to hit to get a nine dart finish. I'm not saying it's not difficult, but to me, um, it's not in the same, league as a 147. As far as a hole in one goes, it's pretty difficult because I haven't made one, but there's a lot of luck involved. You can hit a bad shot and it can bounce the right way and it goes in. So there's a lot of luck involved in a hole in one. I think to do a proper hole in one, yeah, it's very, very difficult. But in the end of the day, it's one shot. Uh, a maximum is 36 shots. We've well, got to have control of that cue ball and things can change and get bad cannons. In terms of if I could uh, choose which one to do tomorrow, obviously it would be the darts one because I don't play darts. Um, I obviously play a lot of golf and it'd be amazing to have a hole in one as I've never made one, but the 147 is the biggest buzz you can get on the table. It's just um, tremendous, it's perfection. So even though I'm not officially um, playing snooker anymore, I'd still pick a 147. Guys, thank you so much um, for all your comments and all your questions. It really means a lot. Um, we really enjoy putting these videos out there. Keep sending your questions in. I'm sure I'll do more of these videos in the future. And if you're enjoying the channel, as usual, please like and subscribe. Have a great new year.